So Gottsman limit setting model, what the idea here is that again, your genes are going to set the limit. Let's say, let's face it, a child who is, you know, got genes for five foot six is not going to be a seven foot tall basketball player, regardless of how many Wheaties you have in the morning, right? So there will be a, a ceiling on your potential, let's say. But there's also going to be a floor level, so you can't go any lower than a certain amount. So let's say IQ. Down syndrome child, normally they would have an IQ between 70 and 80. But again, if you have a simulating environment, that could be risen to, you know, 85, 90. But it might not, it's not going to be 120, right? So your genes will set the limit. Likewise, the lower end. If you have Down syndrome, the lowest that you could possibly could be might be 60. But you're not going to be any lower than that, right, usually. So this is called the range of reaction. It is the window of opportunity, so to speak, or the window for your potential. We are all trying to reach our potential, and we engage in environmental activities like coming to university to increase that. If you didn't, then maybe your IQ would stay at a, a lower level or some other you know, attribute would be at a lower level. So this is what Gottsman's all about. It's a limit set by a genotype. So what this is all about here is basketball school. Just for an example, it could be any trait. And down here we have the environment, how favorable or how stimulating it is to this particular skill. Now down here it's restricted, so in other words there is no environmental stimulation at all. Here it's the natural environment and up here it's enriched. So you may have a household that engages in a lot of, you know, maybe you've got a, a, you know, um, a basketball court in your backyard or some hoops in the backyard and you can go practice with your brothers and sisters or maybe you belong to a club and so it's nurtured in your family or not, right, depending on, again, the environment. But it also depends on your genotype. And this, in this case, would be height. So if you're genotype A, you're not going to be, you know, up here at a seven-foot, you know, level or skill. But you do have a range. The bottom would be down here, and the, height, the highest level would be here. So you are restricted by your genes to this particular range of behavior, or skill in this case. Genotype B, a little bit more skilled. And of course, you also have a range, and this would be in between here, and you get the idea. Genotype C, again, getting maybe taller or more muscular, maybe even more spatial skill. It depends also on those cognitive components as well. And your window of opportunity would be, of course, a wider range. Somebody with genotype B, who probably will end up being a basketball player if you're up here with this particular genotype, then your reaction range is you know, quite, quite broad. So if you were in an environment, even with genotype D, and nobody fostered this skill, you could still have low, low skill, similar to someone with genotype B. You have to have the environmental practice, this is what this is, right? Nurturing the talent. So you could be a musician born with your genes to be a, you know, a musician, but if it's not fostered and practiced, you're not going to reach that level. So this is all about the range, and this is a huge environmental impact. So again, practice makes perfect, right? The old adage. SCARS comes up with this other um, interaction um, for the environment and the genes. And basically, it's looking at the correlation between your genes and the environment. This is really quite simple. It's all about the differential response of your parents, right? So your primary caregiver, it, it doesn't matter whether it's your parents, whoever is who is your custodian. And the idea here is that if you're born with a certain genetic makeup, a certain genotype, then your parents are going to respond to you differently. We tend to think that you're born into this world a blank slate, a tabula rosa, right? And your environment will write on you whatever you're going to be. And of course, that falls to the parents. And this is not the case. The child also comes with a personality, with genetic traits that are going to be played out in the environment. And it's a two-way street between the parent and the child. So the parent may think that they're going to write on the child and create whatever they want, but they have to revise their script many times because the child also brings to the table a set of genetic traits. So you may respond differently to, let's say, an introvert, a child who is naturally introverted, versus a child who is an extrovert. The parent might play with them differently, respond to them differently, and that, of course, is going to be a huge interaction between genes and environment. To get more specific, they come up with differential exposure. And the idea here is the child is born into an environment, but it's going to depend on what they actually, um, of course, bring to the, to the environment in this case. 
So we've got three of them here. I'm just going to explain to you what these mean. If you are, let's say, um, born with the genes to be a musician, so you have the genetic diathesis, the genetic um, profile to be a skilled musician, and you're born to a family or parents who are also musicians, so you've inherited that gene. You're also brought up in an environment that's going to be filled with music, right? So the environment and the genes are both there. The child doesn't have to do anything to actually live out or to express that gene. It's there in the, in the genetic profile, and it's there in the environment. So that child will most likely end up being um, skilled in music. So they don't have to do anything. It's a passive kind of behavior. Evocative is where you actually evoke a differential response. Like I mentioned up here, this here is the same as this. And it's called evocative because you evoke a certain behavior from your caregivers. So let's say your parents aren't necessarily musically inclined. They like music. But you inherit this particular gene, which is, makes you gifted, makes you special when it comes to music. And because you show this preference for music, the parents go out and buy things for you that are, could be music lessons, it could be an instrument. The other brothers and sisters may not have that, so it's a differential response to you. Your genes evoke that interaction from the environment. You get the difference here? Is it good? The last one here is active. The parents don't respond to you any differently than anybody else. They don't go out and promote you know, any kind of uh, stimulation for your particular talent. But because you have it in your genes, it will come out in your behavior at some point. That's called niche peaking. So at a certain point, you might want to go out and find a group to join because you want to be in a band or you want to practice your vocal skills or, let's say, athleticism. Maybe your parents don't do anything different for you, but you actively go out and try and join a sports club. Maybe it's basketball. Maybe it's hockey because you have a particular passion or a talent for that. So you have actively picked out your niche. All right? See the difference among those three? Yes? Hands up, yes. OK, good. It's not rocket science, right? So the, here's the idea. We used to think that most of the differences and similarities in siblings was due to the environment, that the parents would act a certain way and that would cause most of the children to also be the same way. And then studies after study found that this was not necessarily the case, that there is a huge component that is not shared, even in siblings. How many people here come from, how many people are only child? Okay, how many people have let's say a large family, let's say three or four different brothers or sisters. Are you all different? Are any of you close in age? Like a like couple of years between you? And how different are you? Like different on what, I mean physically of course, but what else are you different on? What, what kind of things make you different? You don't know. Your personality and temperaments are different. What else? We got, yeah? Your taste in music, right? What else? Your friends are different. Do you not think that all those ways that you influence the world or the world is influencing you make differences in your behavior and in your personality? Do your parents react to each of you differently or do they react to you all the same? Do they treat you the same or do they treat you differently? And I don't mean fair or not fair. I mean the way that you interact on a, on a regular basis. Is it different for your siblings, each one of you? So are they not reacting to your particular personality in a special way, right? So you also have different friends. And if you have a couple of years between you, I don't know if you're like me, but when I was growing up, that two or three years is huge when you're like seven and ten, right? You don't want that little brother or sister around you, and you don't want them coming near your friends at all, right? and you exclude them and you're mean. And so all this kind of stuff, the way you view your world, is completely different for each one of you. 
And this is what causes the differences in people, not the genes. The genes, yes, of course, there are huge, you know, influence, but it is the non-shared environmental features that are going to be different. So the question is, the environment has a major influence on all of us, but the primarily in the form of which one? Shared, what you share together in the household from the parents, the way you're brought up, the values, the ethics, the punishment, the reward, um, you know, the dynamics of the, of the household, or is it the non-shared? the things that you experience yourself, your own friends, the way your parents respond to you, the way that you are, maybe the middle, the oldest, the youngest, um, differential treatment from the relatives. Which one plays the bigger impact on your behavior? So you're saying only when you're older would it, would it be non-shared? And it will, it will, but by then you should be fully developed, hopefully. But you're right, it will have more, it'll, it'll keep getting more and more as you get older. But initially when you're growing up, developing who you are, let's say from the time you're born until you're, how old will we move out of the house now, 35? <laughs> After you get your, well maybe when you go to school. Um, some people still live home though until they, do, they graduate and then in the basement when they go to grad school and then in the basement until they get their first job. And they build an extension on for an apartment. <laughs> and then you inherit the house. <laughs> um, in any event, it's mostly in the non-shared that they have found that the biggest differences um, occur among siblings, which was contrary to what psychologists used to believe, that a lot of what we shared was due to parents. Now it's more about what you don't share that comes from that interaction, differential view. It's like you have your own lens of how you view your world. So my point is, that there is experiences that are influenced by genetic timing. Sure, the regulator genes at a certain point in time will turn on certain other genes, like puberty, right? It all happens at a certain timed sequence, and that's genetic. Menopause, um, you know, all these kinds of things are genetically timed. Um, but it also depends on our influences, that even the expression of a pre, um, let's say, of a timed trait can also be altered.